If I could ask uh, those of you outside to come in so we can uh, get a prompt uh, start. We're going to begin with uh, a pre-recorded comment uh, by our board chair, Renee Landers. So I want to turn it over to Renee, and then we'll uh, resume the program after her welcoming comments. I assume she's set to go. Well, welcome on behalf of the Academy's Board of Directors, um, for which I'm very privileged to serve as the chair. Every year, the National Academy of Social Insurance honors one or more members for their outstanding contributions to the field of social insurance with the Robert M. Ball Award. Bob Ball was the legendary commissioner of the Social Security Administration and a founding member of the Academy. One of my regrets in life is that I don't recall that I ever met Bob Ball, but his vision and his sense of purpose around the importance of social insurance continues to inspire all that the Academy does today. So with special appreciation to this year's event committee, the Academy's board and staff, and the support of over 50 sponsors listed in your program, our 2023 Ball Award event exceeded its fundraising goal. And at the last um, I learned, uh, we are in reach of exceeding our previous records. So um, knock on wood that by, by the uh, day of this event, uh, you will hear that good news as well. Um, I wanna uh, pay some particular attention to uh, the work of our staff. Um, William Arnone, Bill Arnone, our um, hard working and ever enthusiastic um, Chief Executive Officer Tom Novotny and Ariella Jalal. They have all uh, contributed greatly to the success of tonight's event and obviously to the success of everything that the Academy does on a daily basis. This year's honorees are truly special people. Every year, the honorees are special people. David Blumenthal and Angela Glover Blackwell continue to make tremendous contributions to income and health security and um, health security policy with a particular emphasis on equity. And the Academy is pleased to honor them this evening with the 2023 Ball Award. Um, David Blumenthal has been a physician leader in the healthcare policy arena for decades, and his accomplishments are truly exemplary. Most recently, um, in the, during the Obama administration, he served as the national coordinator for health information technology, where he had the opportunity to implement the High Tech Act, which really um, entrenched the use of electronic medical records in our healthcare system, which has um, created many, many possibilities um, for the future. And so um, he is to be thanked for that major contribution recently to public policy. In addition, a few years ago, along with um, a um, uh, political scientist and historian at Brown University, James Maroney, he published a book called The Heart of Power, Health and Politics in the o Oval Office, which uh, really uh, recounts the contributions of each president, starting with Franklin Roosevelt to uh, the creation of healthcare policy uh, in our country. Um, and the book is, uh, you know, has many biographies of all of these presidents and also talks about how their personal connection to um, health care um, and uh, science policy, um, you know, on a personal level, um, actually uh, helped influence some of the policy uh, provisions that they um, either advocated for or uh, that were enacted during their uh, during their terms in office. So it's a really great contribution to the literature about the evolution of health policy in our country. So we are pleased, and actually it's an honor for the Academy that David Blumenthal has um, agreed to be recognized this evening with the Robert M. Ball Award. Our other honoree, Angela Glover Blackwell, is also an incredibly original thinker in health and uh, income security policy in our country. Um, she, uh, her work has been informed and has taught us all about the impact of systemic racism on um, health inequity and on wealth inequality in our country. 
uh, and she continues to lead the conversation on that issue. Additionally, um, and really connected to the Academy's mission in uh, supporting social insurance, she has also taught us that, um, that programs that benefit vulnerable groups actually benefit us all. Her um, book, The Curb Effect, really uh, sort of talked about that idea. And I think that we would all say, every member of the Academy would say that the, um, that, that philosophy that uh, is at the heart of the reason and the justification for social insurance programs, because by supporting everyone in the society, including the most vulnerable, the society overall, all of us are better. And so we thank Angela Glover Blackwell for her um, many contributions um, on the health, on the equity um, front, and uh, also in teaching us about the interdependence of all of us in the society. During these especially challenging times, the National Academy of Social Insurance is really committed to reinforcing the vital roles that Social Security, uh, Supplemental Security Income, Medicare and Medicaid, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, and universal family care play in providing a foundation of protection against economic and health risks that all of us face at some points in our lives. Um, you know, particularly our uh, earlier work um, in the last decade or so on universal family care policy um, is now really starting to get traction around the country and a lot of local government, uh, state government, and uh, increasingly federal policies really to recognize the importance of family caregiving in allowing people um, to have uh, you know, really productive lives, allowing uh, family caregivers uh, to, to get relief and also to allow people to work and to contribute to the economy. Through our study panels, task forces, reports, and webinars, uh, its summer internship program and the leadership development programs and networking events, the Academy really seeks to fulfill the mission that has guided us since our founding in 1987 to advance solutions to challenges facing the nation by increasing public understanding of how social insurance contributes to economic security. Proceeds from this evening's event are an invaluable source of support for the Academy's work. And I want to acknowledge again um, the contributions of our many sponsors uh, to the event this evening and also to the overall work of the Academy. Since last year's Ball Award, the Academy has issued two major reports that reflect the diverse expertise and perspectives of our task forces on how social insurance and related programs responded to the COVID-19 pandemic and on the older workers retirement and on older workers retirement security. Both reports are available on the Academy's robust website along with all Academy reports. Uh, videos of previous events like this evening's, uh, the Academy um, and our members in the news, uh, which is always interesting to see. I'm always delighted when I read the newspaper and see one of our uh, many members quoted in uh, important articles about contemporary events. Profiles of our board of directors are also found on the website, as well as profiles of staff, previous interns, and there is a membership directory for members. Um, I really um, want to, um, uh, you know, close, before I close, I would be remiss in not um, thanking all of the board members for um, their tireless work uh, during a changing funding and policy landscape that um, has proved to be challenging for the Academy. Um, we have two long-serving board of members of the board of directors, um, Sean O'Brien and Bill Rogers, who will be rolling off the board this year. Sean um, is actually a remarkable board member because he has spent um, most of his tenure on the board as a member and chairing the membership committee, um, really revitalizing um, how we think about membership in the academy, and actually working really hard to recruit. Uh, people so that we continue to have an infusion of uh, up and coming scholars and policy and thought leaders uh, to uh, give vibrancy to all the activities of the Academy. So Sean will definitely be missed for that contribution, along with all the other, uh, you know, his presence at board meetings uh, and his and the wisdom and counsel that he's offered. For Bill Rogers, 
It's also a bittersweet moment because he was my predecessor as the board chair. And it's been a privilege to work with him all these years on the academy business. Uh, he has um, uh, reminds us always that the disciplines like economics, statistics, are in the service of enhancing equality and human well-being. They are not pure e academic exercises, uh, but they are disciplines, um, the exercise of which should be informed by community values. And so Bill constantly um, reminds us that, that these um, the disciplines that we all practice are in service of those values. So we thank both Sean and Bill for their um, for their hard work and for the uh, for the academy. Um, for all the others of uh, members of, of that I of the board, their financial support and their contributions of wisdom, wealth, and work um, have been greatly appreciated by me um, and I know by the staff of the academy that without their um, attention and uh, and uh, uh, their good advice, uh, the academy would not. Um, be able to continue um, to succeed in its work and in, in its mission. Um, and in that regard, I want to give special thanks to the Executive Committee of the Academy because um, their work has been quite challenging during uh, the last several years. Uh, our Vice President, Andy Duda Gupta, uh, is, uh, his, his, his Rolodex and his connections in the social insurance community are uh, in, an incredible asset for the Academy. Um, our treasurer, Merrill Friedman, um, is actually gives us just a really excellent perspective um, from the business community on the activities of the Academy. And finally, last but not least, our secretary, Rebecca Vallis, um, brings uh, so much energy uh, and always, always an optimistic spirit to her work for the Academy. Uh, she uh, was instrumental in uh, obtaining financial support for the Older Workers Task Force and in bringing the report substantively along with the chairs, uh, the coach, the chair of the of this task force and other members of that study committee to bring the report to a very successful conclusion and to uh, really jumpstart the dissemination efforts of that work. Uh, and she's all also been instrumental in helping uh, the Academy obtain funding uh, to uh, to allow us to consider how to create a more sustainable future for the Academy. Uh, one of Rebecca's favorite expressions is to say that she's gonna lift up an issue or uh, uplift an issue to uh, a higher place on an agenda or to uh, lift up uh, certain issues uh, and uh, to uplift the work of others who are making a contribution to the Academy and to the social insurance field. And I just want to say about Rebecca uh, that tonight I want to lift up uh, 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 her many contributions to the Academy over the years and thank her for um, all she has invested in our work. So um, I, again, I am so sorry that I'm not able to be with you in person, but um, I don't know if my students are happy that I'm staying to teach my class in Boston or if they wish I had gotten on that plane to come to Washington. Uh, but I do hope that all of you enjoy this evening's Signature Academy event. And now I'm going to uh, turn the program back to the Academy's uh, Chief Executive Officer, William Arnone. Thank you so much for being here and for listening. Uh, since Renee did single out uh, Rebecca and Sean, I know Rebecca is here. You want to just stand up, Rebecca, and we can give you a round. And uh, Sean... Sean O'Brien was here. He's so modest, he probably knew he was going to be singled out and decided to walk away. Sean, there, just come on in, Sean, so we can give you a well-deserved round of applause. <clears throat> so on behalf of uh, the Academy's Board of Directors and uh, the staff, a small but mighty staff, uh, Ariella uh, Jalal and Tom Novotny, who really worked their... Uh, hearts out on uh, this year's uh, Ball Award. I want to acknowledge the tremendous work they did. Uh, welcome to this uh, special event. Uh, as the Academy's Chief Executive, I relish uh, this annual celebration of individuals whose contributions to sound 
social insurance policy are truly extraordinary. Uh, one of the highlights for me every year is when I get the privilege of calling uh, the awardees and giving them the good news. And the reaction is always the same, deep humility. Uh, when I called Angela, the word you used, Angela, was I am overwhelmed. When I called David Blumenthal, he said, nobody is lining up to give me awards these days. <laughs> I am truly honored in, in David's uh, genuinely self-deprecating style. Uh, before we begin this evening's program, which is a program of celebration, uh, let us take a moment to remember the, uh, the exceptional career of a former Ball Award recipient whom we lost since last year's award event. Bill Spriggs, who won this award in uh, 2016, uh, made a truly lasting contribution uh, to social insurance policy with a sharp focus on equity, equality, and racial justice. Uh, Bill served on the Academy's Board of Directors. He served on several committees, study panels, and task forces. And he was a phenomenal mentor to so many people, including uh, some of us in this uh, room. I often reached out to Bill uh, for his wise counsel. And despite tremendous demands on his time, he was always available to speak candidly to me with, as uh, Renee said, that word wisdom uh, that is uh, something that uh, is indispensable in today's environment. Uh, despite um, the demands on his time, his uh, desire to help was ever present. Uh, I miss him every day. So let's just take a moment of silence in memory of this wonderful and inspiring leader. I also wish to uh, echo Renee's comments about the Academy's uh, truly stellar board of directors. Uh, she's recognized the contributions of members whose terms have expired. However, she omitted one, and that is herself. Uh, Renee is in the last year of her uh, service as our board chair. Uh, she could never have known what she was signing on for. Uh, COVID alone just disrupted everything. Uh, and as Renee said, these have been very challenging times for the Academy, but uh, she has been tough-minded when necessary, uh, tender-hearted whenever, and I will uh, certainly miss her. Uh, she's uh, been uh, a, a close collaborator and has made a major difference. So in her absence, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, tremendous role that uh, Renee has played. Now, we thought we would uh, try something a little different this year. With all the uh, talk about artificial intelligence, uh, we did a pilot. Uh, we asked ChatGPT to uh, help select the honoree. And uh, we fed it a description of the Ball Award and then gave it access to our list of members. And I learned something about ChatGPT. Um, their logarithms, or algorithms, I always get the two confused, um, have a tendency to overweight certain words in a description. In this case, they gave excessive weight uh, to the word ball. <laughs> and they concluded this must be an athletic award. <laughs> so they went into our Academy member database and said you should give the ball award to Hank Aaron, <laughs> who was going to be here tonight, but I don't think uh, Hank quite made it. And uh, uh, I was so happy because we gave Henry Aaron the award in 2007. So, lesson learned. Human intelligence is still way ahead of uh, artificial intelligence. And we didn't need ChatGPT to do what we do best, ask our members to nominate and our board to vote on the uh, honorees uh, this evening, who you're going to hear from uh, more. Um, the event committee of this um, uh, signature event really was outstanding. I want to just rattle off their names. If they're here, please stand up. Henry Aaron, who I think is becoming at some point. Larry Atkins, I see Larry back there. Uh, Bob Berenson, I don't think Bob can make it. Uh, Faye Cook is here. Faye, 
Uh, Derek Hamilton, you'll be seeing on the video. Chris Jennings, a tireless uh, champion of the Academy. Uh, Ted Marmor, a former Ball Awardee, could not be here. Jim Marone, you'll see on the screen. Lynette Rawlings, Lynette has been a phenomenal uh, new member of the Academy, and she's been a model. Uh, Bruce Vladek, who couldn't be here, but also a, a longtime supporter of the Academy. Claire wolf Yarick, a, a part, is she going to be able to join us now? She's hoping? Okay, so we'll, we'll catch up with her later. And I want to say again, Tom Novotny and Ariella Jalal really uh, made all this uh, happen. So hats off to uh, the event committee. And uh, I want to acknowledge the uh, sponsors. They're in your program, but I think they've done so much for us, it's worth singling them all out. Uh, and if you're, if you're with any of the sponsors, just wave so we can give you a personal thanks. AARP, I know Joel Eskovitz is here, and others from AARP are here. Amazon, a part of Mathor. Uh, Arnold Ventures, I know there was someone who was coming. Uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center, Bill Hoagland, always comes through for us. Thank you, Bill. Uh, the Commonwealth Fund, on uh, behalf of, uh, of uh, David, there's Reggie Williams in the back there, and uh, I saw Gretchen earlier, uh, and uh, Louisa, thank you all. Uh, the Economic Security Project, I don't know if they were able to send representatives. Uh, they're the leaders in the fight for what we like to call assured income. They use the expression guaranteed income, but I think we all have the same goal in mind. No matter what happens in life, you should have a floor of income below which you do not fall. And that's been a universal theme uh, we've opened evolved. Howard and Margaret Floor, uh, thank you for your consistent generosity. The Peterson Foundation, I saw Jeff Holland here, other members of the Peterson Foundation, thank you for your support. Lynette Rawlings and the Policy Academies, thank you, thank you, thank you. Policy Link. Angela's um, organization, thank you. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, thank you. There you go, thank you so much. Uh, SCAN Health Plan, anybody here from SCAN? And finally, a uh, foundation that has just funded us for the first time, and that's the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Uh, so I want to thank all the foundations. And those who are at the policy leader level, at the research patron level, America's Physician Groups, Sue Denser, thank you, Sue. Uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, thank you so much, great. Uh, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, uh, Maya McGinnis and her team, thank you. Elevance Health, Merrill Friedman, who will be here. Uh, her colleagues were supposed to get here early. I don't know if they've been able to make it, but thank you. Uh, a new sponsor, in honor of David, Massachusetts General Hospital, Brigham Women's Health. Uh, Jim Marone, you heard uh, about earlier, you'll see him uh, on the screen. Uh, Howard Floors Company, Siegel. Uh, the Urban Institute. And then uh, on the research sustainable level, AFSME, AFGE, the Bank of America, Blue Shield California Foundation, board member Harry Conaway, Faye Cook, and does Tom get credit too? He should get credit for this. No, he doesn't want credit for this. Okay. Uh, Bill Hoagland again in, in, in a personal, and Virginia Reno. Virginia, does Lee get credit for this? He better, he's, he's sitting next to you. So yeah, so Lee gets rid of this too. So thank you to all of you. Without you, we would not have achieved the success. And as Renee said, we are this close to breaking the all-time record that was set last year. And we never closed the books on the Ball Award. So if you might have said, gee, I don't think I contributed, it's never too late to put us over the top and we'll uh, let everybody know. So, we want to begin with honoring our first um, honoree. I'm going to ask uh, Chris Jennings and uh, Robert Espinoza to come up on the stage. Uh, they'll be actually uh, doing the, uh, the presentation. Um, but let's uh, start with uh, three people who um, were kind enough to uh, provide pre-recorded uh, remarks on behalf of David uh, Blumenthal. We're going to start with remarks from Mandy Cohen, the new head of the uh, CDC. Talk about a challenging position. So she's right in the mix of it. So let's hear from Mandy. Hi, everyone. It's Mandy Cohen. I'm the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and I'm so honored to be a part of celebrating Dr. David Blumenthal tonight. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I wanted to share, you know, I've known David more than 20 years now. We first met when I was a medical student and hopeful one day resident to be under, under his teaching at Mass General. And I worked with him over at Mass General doing work on thinking about how to make this system better. And it was the first time that I got to interact with David and just see his brilliant mind at work. Um, he has been 
so important in my professional growth. He has been a mentor and a sounding board um, and a friend as I've gone through uh, different phases of, of my career and thought about how can I make the greatest impact on uh, the healthcare system. You know, David's been a leader in health policy for decades. Um, he's not just a beautiful writer, um, but his clarity of thought and his analysis of what's happening around us, the ability to sort of see into the future and help us think about the steps we can take to make the system better and work for everyone is just so impressive and something I, I have tried to uh, learn from every day. You know, he's dedicated his life to making this a better, more equitable system that works for everyone. Um, and I'm so proud to have known him for these last 20 years, to have been able to learn from him these last 20 years. And I look forward to many more years of his contribution um, to the work to make sure that this healthcare system is truly working for everyone. David, it's an honor to just say a few words tonight. Thank you so much um, for everything you've done for me and, and more importantly, for this country. Congratulations on your award. Hello, I'm delighted to be giving a, a talk to, uh, to all of you at NASI. Uh, and I'm talking from France, thus the chandelier, et cetera. I'd like to tell you about first how I met David Blumenthal. He called me once years ago and he asked me for a political scientist who knew something about presidents and could do healthcare. And I, I gave him lots of good suggestions. And then I realized, oh no, He's not calling for suggestions. He's inviting me to join his team and thinking about the presidents and healthcare. And among the wisest decisions of my life was saying yes to David. In the course of writing that book and then a second one we're working on now, we've done a lot of interviews. And there's one thing that's really interesting about the interviews we've done, and that is everybody already knows David. It doesn't matter who we talk to, they know David. We talked to Max, Senator Max Baucus, and they remember each other from when David was on Senator Kennedy's staff. We talked to a well-known journalist, and they worked together on the Harvard Crimson. We talked to Tony Fauci, and they met at a conference run by the Commonwealth Foundation. We talked to Obama, and Obama and David remember each other from the time David briefed Obama in the Oval Office of the benefits of having uh, medical records online. From all this, I draw two conclusions. One, once a friend of David, always a friend of David. He has this incredible network because people like him, he likes people, and they cling on to him over the years. They remember him. And secondly, what an interesting set of lives David Blumenthal has lived. He's been on Senate staff for Ted Kennedy. He's been presidential campaign advisor for pretty much all the Democrats, winners and losers. He's been in the Obama administration uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services trying to get medical records online. Of course, he was president of the Commonwealth Foundation. He's done stints now and then as a professor at Harvard. And in his spare time, he studies French, doing a French conversation conversation uh, three times a day with, with a Frenchman in Cambridge. These are all such interesting lives, and he's just done so much uh, in, his, in, his, uh, in his days as, um, as doing so many different things. David also, like so many uh, political people is given to giving rants. Now, as a political scientist, I have a license to rant about politics. Uh, so recently, just to give you an example, I started ranting about who was it who thought that it might be a good idea to have a mandate requiring American people to buy health insurance. And David very quietly said, yeah, Cutler and I told the Obama people that this was a bad idea. And I thought, oh yeah, David's rants are different than me. They're quiet, they're calm, and they're wise. I just wish uh, that everybody, when David had a little political rant, would listen to him, would be in such a better world. Well, I've suggested a lot of things about David Blumenthal, but there's one thing that ties them all together, ties all those lives together, all those interests together, all those friends together, and that's this. David constantly thinks and works for the common good. He's always, all these things are about making us a better society 
building a better healthcare system, having a better country. And in that, I think David really is like Bob Ball and is a most deserving member of the Ball Award. Here's a person I very much admire. And if you feel slightly left out because you're not a friend of David, don't worry, he'll come around and make your friendship soon. Thanks and goodbye from Paris. Good evening. My name is Dr. Joseph Betancourt and I'm president of the Commonwealth Fund. I'm really sorry I'm not there with you today in person. Patient responsibilities have kept my attention sadly today, but it's an honor and a privilege to present my mentor, my colleague and my friend, Dr. David Blumenthal with the Robert M. Ball Award, which is presented to an individual whose work has made a significant impact on the US social insurance system and is granted tonight by the National Academy of Social Insurance. David has dedicated his career to public service with a focus on health policy, and he's done this for multiple purges, but that dedication has remained steadfast. From his earliest days serving under Senator Kennedy on the staff of the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Health and Scientific Research, to his time as National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, David has committed himself to the principles of affordable, high-quality health care for all. It's also no coincidence that this is the mission of the Commonwealth Fund, which he led as president for a decade, and I have the incredible honor of following his lead now. David held several leadership positions in medicine, government, and academia. His key qualities have been humble, steady, principled leadership, and his expertise in health policy is second to none. Beyond all of his accolades, it's important for me to detail the measure of the man that David is beyond his extensive CV. I first met David as a Commonwealth Fund Fellow in Minority Health Policy in 1997. He was on the board of the Commonwealth Fund at that time and a strong supporter of this fellowship, which was the first of its kind in the nation focused on building a cadre of minority healthcare leaders. Just a short two years later, David welcomed me into the Institute for Health Policy at Massachusetts General Hospital, which he founded and led for another decade. When I got to know David even better at that time, it was clear that he was a thoughtful, dedicated mentor who aimed to help all those he came in contact with reach their full potential. And certainly, I was privileged and I was no exception as he shepherded my idea to create the Disparity Solutions Center back in 2005. He was far ahead of his time in supporting individuals like me with ideas like mine. But I'm just one of countless individuals whose career he selflessly has helped launch, grow, develop, and support. David exemplifies effectiveness in deepening public understanding, fostering collaboration, informing policy, implementing policy, and teaching others about social insurance. The perfect awardee for this recognition. David's a national treasure, an unsung hero that has helped improve the lives of countless Americans, both through his work and dedication to mentoring others who've aspired to follow in his footsteps. Speaking of footsteps, when I began my position as president of the Commonwealth Fund following David, it was said by many, many times that I literally and figuratively had big shoes to fill. Well, I can say with certainty, certainty today that both literally and figuratively, I will never fill his shoes. But I know he knows, and you should all know, that I will follow his footsteps. I will follow his lead and his guidance, as I always have, and continue his efforts in support of social insurance and so many of the critical health policy areas that David has demonstrated leadership on. David's so deserving of this award, and I really feel blessed and honored to be able to present it to him today. Thank you, David, for all you've done for our nation, for the National Academy of Social Insurance, for myself. Esteemed colleagues, please join me in recognizing the winner of the 2023 Robert M. Ball Award, Dr. David Blumenthal. Now, it's going to be a little awkward for Robert and Chris and I to present it to David without him being here, but this event is being recorded tonight, so we'll be able to do it in absentia, but with the same impact, I hope. So, Chris, Robert. I'm so proud to have you.
Now uh, David is uh, going to again join us virtually with uh, remarks that he's prepared on this occasion. So uh, one of our 2023 Ball awardees, David Blumenthal. Good evening, friends and colleagues. Uh, I'm so sorry not to be with you in person, but last week, by my quick and dirty epidemiologic calculations, I contracted COVID despite every vaccination known to science at a conference on, of all things, artificial intelligence. Never underestimate the natural world and its evolutionary guile. My sincere thanks to the National Academy of Social Insurance for its long commitment to the welfare of Americans and for this terrific recognition. I well remember my first involvement with the National Academy of Social Insurance on a panel on how to better manage chronic illness under Medicare. I've stayed involved in the effort to improve care of chronically ill patients over the years, and it was I was pleased to be part of the effort through work at the Commonwealth Fund to facilitate the passage of the Chronic Act of 2018 which enabled the provision of supplemental benefits for the chronically ill under Medicare Advantage. Making those benefits available through traditional Medicare remains an unfulfilled promise. I also want to thank my good friends and colleagues, Joe Betancourt, Mandy Cohen, and Jim Marone, for their very kind remarks. It's been my privilege to know and work with them for decades on a variety of common projects and in a variety of common ways. Jim deserves special gratitude for nominating me for this award and for putting up with me as a co-author on one and soon to be two books on healthcare and the presidency. As I reflect on this award and the Academy's mission, I can't help thinking back to the origin of social security and the failed gesture at the time toward enacting a sickness benefit as part of the 1934 Social Security program, and then reflecting on the distance we have come since. Some believe that FDR's first term with its precedent-shattering New Deal, which defined, redefined the role of the federal government in American life, was the last best chance we had as a country to enact comprehensive national health insurance. FDR decided not to pursue it in the end, uh, despite toying with it off and on during the deliberations of his Committee on Economic Security, which gave birth to Social Security. At the time, health care coverage was, in his view and that of his advisors, primarily an economic issue, not a health care one a way of helping manage one more expense that Americans face during the Great Depression. We'll never know why FDR turned away. He was one of our most enigmatic, inscrutable, and talented presidents. But as a physician and a health policy type, I can't help noting that the sum total of his advisors on health care at the time consisted of Dr. Ross McIntyre, his personal physician, and an ear, nose, and throat specialist who saw the president every day before he got out of bed, and Dr. Harvey Cushing, his son's father-in-law, and a pioneering Hopkins and Harvard surgeon, now considered the father of modern neurosurgery. McIntyre also served as FDR's liaison to the American Medical Association. His qualifications to attend the president were that he took care of the president's annoying sinus problem. Cushing wanted to be president of the American Medical Association. Both of them channeled the American Medical Association's furious opposition to comprehensive health care coverage. 
and the president's rare references to health care during the time that Social Security was under consideration were dominated by reassurances to physicians that he would not do anything that irritated them. You can almost fear him whispering in his comments that McIntyre came pushing. And of course, any American president is attended, some might say afflicted, by an army of professional health advisors, including some perhaps in this very room. They might have helped FDR see things differently. We'll never know. Personally, I think FDR also shied away from healthcare issues because they might have drawn attention to his own infirmity which he zealously hid with, hid with the media's complicity from the American people. I think back on this episode now because of how far we've come. The road has been bumpy, erratic, complicated, painful. It's taken way too long. But as we stand here, only 7.7% of the 330 million Americans lack health care coverage. And in many blue states like Massachusetts, Vermont, Hawaii, and Minnesota, the rate is at 5% or below. Those states are within striking distance of rates of coverage seen in other high-income countries. Personally, I was never confident we would get this far. The critical accomplishments have, of course, been Medicare, Medicaid, and the Affordable Care Act. One of the notable features of health insurance expansions in the U.S. is that they are like a rusty wheel that turns in only one direction toward coverage. The wheel is very hard to turn. It resists furiously but it is almost impossible to turn back. Witness the unsuccessful effort to repeal the Affordable Care Act. I'm confident that a number of the 10 holdout states will expand Medicaid as their rural hospitals progressively close, and as the memory of President Obama becomes less toxic over time. Paraphrase Martin Luther King, the arc of justice is long, but it bends toward coverage. The insurance system we are building on is characteristically American, messy, complicated, inequitable, not particularly generous, overly burdensome administratively and costly. It lacks the efficiency and simplicity that a social insurance system would have brought. But in my view, the era in which enacting comprehensive of national health insurance, whether we call it Medicare Advantage, Medi I'm sorry, Medicare for All or something else, drives national primary and general election results, they have come to an end. Universal coverage, however imperfect, is too close, especially in progressive states where voters are the engine for universal coverage. Goal now is to make our insurance system cheaper, better, and simpler. That is the agenda that our now robust cohort of health policymakers will be pursuing going forward. Thank you very much. One of the uh, foundations that uh, funded us, they said to me when we applied for support, they said, you know, Bill, we don't uh, fund events unless they have an educational component. And I said, I think from our two awardees, you will get education. We've had one test of it here. I know we're going to get the same thing from uh, Angela. Let me ask uh, Angela, Cecilia Conrad, and Lett Rawlings to come up on the stage uh, to um, help us kick off the second part of our program. Uh, Lynette, I've already introduced. Cecilia Conrad is a member of our board of directors uh, with the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, and also, uh, I want to uh, just identify, even though one of them is on his way out, <laughs> two uh, previous uh, Ball Award honorees. John Rother, before you leave, John, just uh, 
Well, he's on the John Rother. And Bob uh, Greenstein. I see Bob over here. Bob. And um, Bob Reischauer is supposed to be here. I haven't seen Bob yet, but I thought we should honor the history of the Ball Award um, uh, through them. Uh, now we're going to uh, turn to Angela Glover Blackwell, and we're going to begin by uh, listening to uh, pre recorded remarks by event committee member Derek Hamilton. Congratulations, Angela. I wish I could be there in person. I'm on my way to Atlanta to try to advocate and promote for baby bonds. There is no one more deserving than you in receiving this award. You have a career that is so pronounced. You have impacted so many people, founded and led arguably the premier organization, black led organization addressing poverty, inclusion, civic engagement, all the values that this ball award represents. Policy link begins with conception, a conception about the world and understanding of inclusion, justice, equity. But beyond that, it's, it's about action. It's about engaging with organizations from policymakers to media, to advocacy, uh, to people in your own backyard. And with that engagement, there is concrete policy to go along with that. There is innovation. If we think of the arc of your career, if we think of the art of policy link, we've gone from a period of neoliberalism to now where we are, a period where we recognize that investments in people and the places they live are the pathways forward. You've been talking about this for decades and you've done this with an unapologetic commitment to both justice and boldness. Boldness grounded in doing what is right. Personally, I've benefited from you and the model that you've set. I hope I make you proud. There's an army of people with whom you have engaged, which I know are grateful and proud and hope that you are proud of us. And what's more, you've done this with grace, despite all the despair, all the inequity, all the vulnerability, you do this work with grace. You are a teacher, you are a role model, you are an inspirer, you are an innovator, and you are a doer. I'm proud to know you, I'm grateful for all that you have done and continue to do. And once again, congratulations. And let me welcome Lynette Rawlings. Lynette. That Angela Glover Blackwell's career has been transformational to the public policy field is undeniable. So how does this relate to social insurance? As I see it, Angela's work shares some of the same moral and underpinnings and economic rationale that undergird the system of social insurance. The belief that we are all in it together and that helping the most vulnerable makes everyone better off. The US social insurance system is fundamentally a statement on who we are as a society and how we choose to ensure the mutual well-being of our fellow residents that we contribute to a system so everyone has a buffer from undue hardship, whether that is because of retirement or unforeseen life circumstances. It is not only the knowledge that by making this investment, we and our loved ones may one day rely on these supports. It is also the understanding that as a society, we are better off when no one is allowed to fall too far. Together, we create a sense of general stability and common good. However, for much of its history, social insurance has not focused on racial equity, and in fact, actively excluded entire classes of workers, often because of race. Glaring injustices that have left its structures of support incomplete. It was not that long ago that mainstream public policy avoided the mention of race. For many who did care about racial repair and fairness, the hope was that equal outcomes would be the happy after effect of focusing on income or class. Our current racial disparities were actively created 
and continue to be upheld by a web of systems and structures and institutions and regulations, et cetera. Angela was one of those who knew this would not be undone by polite workarounds, no matter how well-intentioned or well-designed. Angela was not only the first to name racial equity as being essential to building a just society, she also constructed an intellectual framework around this approach, and with PolicyLink, backed that up with rigorous, data-driven analyses. Angela's call was to be deliberate, intentional, and bold in creating a just and fair society that works for all. Another way that Angela's career relates to social insurance is her focus on intergenerational transfers of resources, in this case, through her mentoring. I am not sure how well known it is, but Angela actively invests in younger generations of leadership more than anyone I know. She gives generously of her wisdom, guidance, platforms, and networks, making introductions, opening doors, giving encouragement, lending credibility, and serving on numerous boards. She encourages creative thinking and new ideas, even when they're not directly in line with her own. She does not try to mold people in her image. She supports people being the best version of themselves and bringing out their unique visions for how they want to do their work in the world. There is hardly a black or brown Gen X leader I have met who has not been influenced by or often directly touched by Angela. And to give you an idea of how deep that support goes, Angela agreed to be my board chair when I was just starting the Policy Academies. We were a staff of one, and there was $20,000 in the bank. Um, and she's a national leader. <laughs> Looking back, I can only imagine what she must have been thinking when she agreed to my audacious request. <laughs> I barely knew the full reality of what I was getting myself into. But by her saying less, yes, and lending her valuable time and reputation, Angela gave me the cover that allowed me to figure it out. I'm not alone in receiving that kind of support for her. We are in a time when cross-generational relationships are painfully fraught. If a small fraction of us leaned in the way that Angela has for her entire career, we would go a long way to repairing those generational rifts, especially as we ask younger generations to support us in our aging years. They might see that social insurance system as a bit fairer if they could feel we were supporting them this way as well. So to everyone, be more like Angela. Thank you. And now Cecilia Conrad. Cecilia? So I'm going to start on a personal note because I'm here primarily as a fangirl. Um, I have admired the work of Angela Glover Blackwell for years, but we've always had these moments where we were just almost in the same places, but I've never really had the opportunity to spend time with her. It begins with the fact that she grew up in St. Louis, and I was born in St. Louis, but my parents moved me at six months, so that opportunity was missed. <laughs> uh, fast forward 45 years, um, I co-edited a book with several others, African Americans in the U.S. Economy. Policy Link sort of helped to host a book launch for us. And she was on a panel, and then at the end of the panel, I was on a panel. But when my panel was gone, she was gone, so I missed the opportunity again. So when Bill asked me if I would say some words, I thought, at last, <laughs> I'll have a chance to express my admiration in person. Angela Glover Blackwell has been an eloquent and persistent voice for ensuring the well-being of the most vulnerable among us. Founding and leading Policy Link would be enough to justify this award. Policy Link for two decades has been an organization that has helped policymakers, the public, but for my perspective, philanthropists in particular, understand that there are solutions to advance racial and economic equity. Foreclosing the option that certainly many philanthropists would take of throwing up their hands and saying, oh, there's nothing to be done, there are no solutions out there. But beyond policy link, it's not, it's not that she stopped there. She has maintained her presence in public discourse through her podcast, Radical Imagination, 
through opinion pieces in the New York Times and the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Particularly if you have not read it, I urge you to read her piece on how to have a multiracial democracy. I'm going to quote from there, and I'm borrowing a little bit. Bill quoted from the same piece, but this is just, it's so powerful for me. America needs a new story, one that is honest and inspiring, and that doesn't shy away from its racial history, to guide us toward realizing a thriving multiracial democracy. So we are recognizing her today for the work she's done, but also for what the next act will be in this space. <laughs> bravo, bravo. Thank you. Thank you for those amazing words, and to Derek as well. Thank you to the National Academy of Social Insurance. Thank you all for coming. And I must say that it is a lovely award in every way. It's physically quite beautiful, and it's just a lovely thought. And unexpected. Um, not surprised tonight. Of course, I came because I knew I was getting it. <laughs> but unexpected when I think about the paths that I have followed. Um, I grew up in a segregated St. Louis, Missouri in the 1950s and the early 60s. It, the good part about it was that the entire black community lived together. And so the richness, the fullness. I often tell people that growing up there that the black adults literally were scaffolding that allowed us to be able to move up and reach our full potential even as we were locked out of the mainstream. But what I learned there was the power of place, the power of joy, and the power of creativity. I came out of college into the black power movement, not the, grew up in the civil rights movement, but came out of college into the black power movement and the anti-war movement. And I was strident and angry and the smartest I've ever been in my life. Uh, I've just gone down from there. I knew everything, <laughs> everything. And I was an organizer for seven years before I went to law school. But from being an organizer and being in those movements at that time, I understood the power of urgency and impatience and anger and moral outrage. I went from there to being a public interest attorney for 10 years in a national public interest law firm. And there I learned how to translate outrage and anger into strategy, how to be able to find the lever, find the thing that you can do something about and use the law to be able to do it. But didn't forget about the power and wisdom of community and didn't forget about the outrage so that our work was not just the law, but we were always in the media framing the issue. We were always in community talking about it with community and learning. I went from there, and I was tell this quick story because I think I have time to tell it. I went from there to starting an organization called the Urban Strategies Council because of Bill Moyers. It was in, the, in January of 1986, and Bill Moyers had a special on television called The Vanishing Black Family. And what he was talking about was the changing nature of poverty in the black community. There was a lot going on. It wasn't the black community that I had grown up in the 50s and 60s. It was a different black community. And I remember turning to my husband and saying, if this country is going to focus on poverty, I don't want to be a litigator when that happens. I want to be in it in a different way. And that led me to start the Urban Strategies Council in Oakland, which was a local community building organization 
building on what I knew about community, building on what I understood about the power of place, but pulling in policy and best practice and working with people who were working for change to be able to make the best change possible. It was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. The Rockefeller Foundation invited me to come and be the uh, senior vice president there. And I stayed for only a short period of time because I realized I'm an activist at heart and I needed to get back to that. But I had learned so much what led to the founding of PolicyLink, which was founded on the notion of advancing racial equity. But it was founding on the notion that we had to do policy from the wisdom, voice, and experience of people who were working for change in their community because they had that wisdom. It was founded on the notion that without honest attention played to race, we're going to keep revisiting the same issues again and again. And it was founded on the notion that you can't solve these problems in any one silo. It takes organizers and researchers and community developers and community builders and service providers and strong advocacy in order to make change. I now thank you, Cecilia, for talking about democracy because I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed because everything that I have described to you has been operating from the margins. I lived in a community that was marginalized. I worked as an, an organizer with communities that were marginalized. I was an advocate for those who had been marginalized. And I've come to appreciate that those who are marginalized really have the capacity to be able to breathe life into democracy. Because democracy really is about self-governance based on a sense of mutuality. That when we came up with the definition of equity, it was just and fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential with an emphasis on the all. And there is no all if we can't get to the very specifics of those who need the attention most. People who are black and brown and people with disabilities and people who are pushed to the side. But we have become a nation that is now made up of those who have been marginalized that the future is dependent on the very people who we have systematically left behind. And it is a wonderful opportunity to realize democracy. It is a big idea, it is a wonderful idea, and there is not an example of thriving democracy existing within the context of profound difference. And if we get it right here, that is what we will have. And so I find us at a place where we have to really envision radically inclusive, radically inclusive so that no one can think that we're not talking about a future that includes them, radically inclusive, thriving, multiracial democracy that serves human flourishing, which means that all of the issues that you have concerned about, that has to be what we're informing with our radically inclusive, thriving, multi, uh, racial democracy that serves human flourishing, that can lead to the good life, that can lead to a good life. And it's so important to add that because flourishing doesn't necessarily lead to a good life, but it can lead to a good life. If we remember the joy of community, we remember the aspirations of people, if we remember that hope is a discipline, Hope is a discipline. It takes discipline to get up every day and hope, but hope is a discipline that includes having a North Star, gathering the information and the data about what's going on, where do we need to go, finding things that work, turning those into policy, and always remembering that it's our mutuality and our sense of self-governance to be able to serve our mutuality and well-being that is what we're looking for in democracy. I thank you so much for this honor. here. So that's uh, a second record we've broken, the longest prolonged standing ovation in the history of the Robert M. Ball Award. Thank you, Angela Glover Blackwell. Uh, thank you, uh, David Blumenthal. Now let me ask Rebecca Vallis and Aparna Mathur of the Academy's board 
to uh, give us a closing toast. Now, for a toast, you need a drink, but I guess we can't have you all go to the bar and come back with drinks unless we have a virtual way of doing, doing this. But you know what? Better. Aparna and Rebecca. Thank you, Bill. This has been such an amazing and inspiring evening, listening to Angela and David and their stories and you know all the ins inspiration that we've all sort of gotten from their work and their life. I'm really pleased to give this toast on behalf of the National Academy and also on behalf of Amazon, where I work as an economist researching labor, safety, and health issues relevant to our workforce. I've always been inspired by the work and the vision of the Academy, which is to design systems of social insurance that contribute to economic security. We all face challenges as we go through our lives related to jobs, health, family, and retirement. Social insurance offers a mean by which we can pool these risks across the population so that unanticipated economic shocks do not hit any individual family as hard. I remember when I worked on public policy relating to the provision of paid family and medical leave, social insurance mechanisms that allowed families to contribute minimal amounts to pay for leave at the time of birth of a child or to take care of medical needs seemed like a sensible solution. And it is heartening to see how these systems have been established across multiple states just in the last few years. Our two honorees have made an impact on public policy in important and tremendous ways. Angela has moved us forward in our understanding of racial and economic inequities and how to improve opportunity for all. And David has pushed for further investments in our nation's public health infrastructure, a critical requirement for a thriving and secure nation. Having just emerged from a period of crisis wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic, where social insurance systems embedded in our social safety net played an important role in providing people the support they need we need to continue to work harder to understand where opportunities for improvement lie. The work of the Academy will continue to be relevant in the years and decades ahead as the country faces new and often unanticipated challenges. Thank you, Bill and Renee and all the Academy members who have created awareness of these risks and who work hard every day to define innovative solutions and ideas to addressing them. And thank you for taking me along on the journey. See, I've been a board member of the Academy long enough to know you get the drink before they finish serving so that you sit down with it for the toast, but you guys, you guys will learn. Um, uh, my name's Rebecca Vallis. I'm a senior fellow at the Century Foundation. I'm co-founder of the Disability Economic Justice Collaborative, and I'm proud to have had the honor to serve as an Academy board member for almost eight years, which is, I was, I was younger and hipper and a lot of things back then. Um, and it's a, it's a complete honor and a privilege to get to toast both of our remarkable awards this evening, and particularly, not to pick favorites, but for me personally, Angela Glover Blackwell, who has been an important influence for so many of us public interest lawyers who have found our way to, to strategic and systems change work. Core to why I spend so much time working to advance and strengthen social insurance isn't just that I'm a recovering public benefits lawyer um, or that I believe that poverty is a political choice. It's my belief that as human beings, we are all interconnected. We've all heard a lot tonight about that theme, interconnectedness, interdependence. Our fantastic chair, Renee Landers, brought that theme in right up front in her opening remarks. And it feels right as a group of people who are committed to working to advance and strengthen social insurance that we close out the evening with that same theme. And so particularly at a time when not just needless and immoral levels of poverty, but also significant global conflict and bloodshed um, weigh heavily upon our hearts. When Bill asked if I would contribute to this evening's toast, I was moved to bring in some words about interconnectedness, which I have found particularly powerful and resonant and which allow me to keep hope alive in my heart, hope being a discipline, um, uh, and, and um, in, in recent years, and, and particularly as someone who believes strongly that public policy is best shaped not just by the mind, but also by the heart. 
And these words feel especially fitting as a coda to much of what Angela Glover Blackwell was just speaking about, about what it looks like to channel pain and even outrage into strategy and into change. And these words come from Joanna Macy. She's an activist and author and a scholar of Buddhism as well as systems theory. These words are like living cells in a larger body. It is natural that we feel the trauma of our world. We are capable of suffering with our world and that is the true meaning of compassion. It enables us to recognize our profound interconnectedness with all beings. Don't ever apologize, she writes, for crying for the trees burning in the Amazon or over the waters polluted from mines in the Rockies. Don't apologize for the sorrow, the grief, and the rage that you feel. It is a measure of your humanity and your maturity. It is a measure of your open heart. And as your heart breaks open, there will be room for the world to heal. Both of the awardees tonight represent remarkable and inspirational cells in that larger body of which we are all part, inspiring each of us to remember our profound interconnectedness, the common humanity behind why we all do this work. It's not budgets, it's not numbers and, and spreadsheets, right? It's the, it's the common humanity. And the importance of bringing not just our heads, but our hearts to this work. So please join me in raising a glass to Angela Glover Blackwell and David Blumenthal. Thank you, Aparna. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you to all of you. I hope you found tonight a truly memorable experience. If people in your networks who couldn't be here in person, please tell them to go on our website starting next week and relive this uh, tremendous experience. So thanks to all of you. Have a good night.